Hi, welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and co-host is uh, Chris Lucian. And today, excited to have uh, two guests, uh, Yuki Togawa and Christopher Martin on the show. Uh, they have a cool new uh, mob programming tool that they've developed. And we're going to be talking about that, how it's similar and different from other mob programming tools. We'll be talking about mob programming and education because that is their context right now. And uh, also talk about some technical aspects and how it makes a difference in education uh, and uh, mobbing tools. Um, but before we jump into those topics, uh, uh, I'll have each of you introduce yourself, uh, starting with you, Yuki. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Austin. So I'm Yuki Tagawa. I'm working as a software engineer at the Ryazan Holdings in Japan. Um, actually, I'm doing the Web3 project with blockchain in field right now. Then I was graduating from the California State University in San Marcos. Then I, I and the you know it's Chris we, uh, built the our more programming tool. Then I graduated. So that's that's me. Thanks. And go ahead, Christopher. Yeah. And so thanks again for the introduction. So I'm Christopher Martin. Uh, similar to Yuki, uh, we both went to Cal State San Marcos, uh, where we completed our master's program. And as part of our thesis research on um, intelligent tutoring systems cool. in collaboration, we developed this mob programming tool uh, since, since graduating and finishing up that research. Uh, I've gone into the education side and have been a professor. Right on, right on. Uh, very cool. Well, th again, thanks for being on the show. And I guess let's just jump right in. Uh, so what is this tool uh, you've been working on? Uh, yeah, what would be like a good high level overview of this mobbing tool? Are you okay if I take this one, Yuki? Sure. Yeah, right. awesome. Yep. So effectively, uh, what we aimed to develop and research um, was trying to create a tool that could help students uh, learn how to collaborate. Um, because collaboration is such an important aspect in programming, software engineering, um, and many other areas. Uh, and we found that where, while there are many tools that exist to help students learn maybe like a particular topic, um, there weren't many that helped facilitate that learning about how to work in a group uh, and communicate with one another. What we found was that mob programming was a very effective way to sort of teach that. Uh, in a very structured manner. Uh, and so we reached out to you both uh, with the help of our advisor, uh, Dr. Rika Yoshi, uh, and kind of started from there, got our kind of toes wet with mob programming. And from there, we just developed the tool, um, again, with that aim of trying to help students collaborate through that lens of mob programming. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I guess a, a follow-up question is, um, so it's a tool that teaches students how, how to collaborate, um, I guess, step-by-step, step, how does the tool work? What does it do? Um, is it something you download? Is it something you log into? Yeah. How, how does that work? Yeah, of course. So, um, it is kind of a, a two-stage tool. I guess it would be better to think about it more about a learn uh, as a learning platform, um, in the sense where you'll download, uh, an application. Uh, but you will also have like an account that you would register. Um, and that was one of the, the big technical differences between, say, our tool and many of the existing, say, Mob, Ensemble, Pomodoro timers that exist or are very commonly utilized. Um, ultimately, sort of at the surface level, it's not doing anything different um, than many of those tools outside of a few minor things where, you know, oh, it's telling you, say, switch drivers um, and, and when to take a break and things like that. Um, however, in the background, uh, it's watching sort of what you're doing. Um, it's using, say, both user response uh, at the end of a session, as well as looking at certain activities that you're performing during a session in order to give you personalized feedback. Um, and to try and suggest things like roles, break uh, frequency, duration, et cetera. Um, so really AI backed, um, really data driven, not only in a sense to kind of provide a better mob programming experience, but one specifically tailored to kind of get you introduced kind of from zero to, you know, mob programming expert. 
Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe starting with Yuki, uh, what did you guys have different roles as you were working on this? Like uh, what, what was kind of the human side behind uh, the development of this? <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's kind of hard, you know, for, for two of them, it's probably each other to be one project, right? So we are dividing the um, first like server side and front end side. Then mostly we were thinking to uh, build the AI model to embed with our mobile programming system in the future. So um, Chris was doing the server side mostly, then I was doing the front end side, like using the um, React, Nate, React and uh, other JS type of languages, then create a web portal and, you know, creating a login system. Then, yeah, it's like mostly the, we, our system was aiming for the, um, Right now we are aiming for just for the desktop application. And eventually we can do um the web application as well, right? So yeah. It's kind of funny that uh for a project around mob programming, the academic system makes it hard to work together. So you have to work individually to build everything. <laughs> um yeah. so uh yeah, I guess in what ways did you um or how did you find ways to collaborate that allowed for your uh, thesis uh, to be separate from each other, but at the same time working toward the same goal? What was what was that like? I mean, we have to think about from the um, very beginning because we can do we can write the same thing in the our separate paper, right? So we have to, um, you know, Doctor Eric or she help us to. How to separate the project, you know, how to um like separate our task as well, right? So this is a mostly the architecture size. Then yeah, it's just architecture for the our project. Then after that we just write what we you know, just what we do um uh, individually, right? So the mostly architecture of our projects, you know, is mainly the um application side, it's it's most most hard part of us. Yeah, and so as as Yuki mentioned, um, a big part of our research um, was the tool, but that wasn't kind of the end goal. Uh, it was building the tool as sort of a proof of concept to show uh, that the idea of an intelligent tutoring system using mob programming could help students learn how to collaborate. Um, and because of that, that it was very research focused, uh, especially for our thesis. Um, we each had to sort of have our own original research. Uh, and so, as Yuki mentioned, I sort of took the back end side of that and the architecture, and then he focused in on the front end. Um, and so we sort of had to start together, right? Uh, we planned everything out. We had a few meetings, uh, the four of us. Um, and then after that, we sort of had to break and then touch base every now and again, right? Like, oh, I make this change, or I set up this API route. Um, what do you need, say, on the front end? Just a lot of that sort of very typical conversation. Um, but then especially, you know, as things start coming together uh, at the end to make sure that everything's kind of working uh, the way it should. But luckily we were able to set that up in a way where there, there weren't very many uh, areas that we needed to collaborate super duper heavily on. Um, ultimately it came down to maybe like one API and then uh, just the applications themselves. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I have a whole host of questions. This is super fascinating for me. I guess maybe one more uh, kind of practical piece mm -hmm. is, so I, I imagine a lot of our audience is familiar with mob programming, and I imagine a lot of our audience has used a mob timer of some kind before. And so, like you said, on the surface, it doesn't feel that different from other mob timers to begin with. Um, but then it starts giving feedback. And I'm sorry if you already covered that, but at what point does it give you feedback and how does it give you that feedback to teach you how to collaborate exactly? Like uh, maybe maybe an example workflow yeah, for a team using it would be would be good. Yeah. Yeah. So the probably most subtle thing is um, imagine you open up a Pomodoro or mob timer and it sort of has those default values um, of like, oh, how many breaks you want, how frequently the breaks are, how long each driver is going to spend um, kind of taking on that role. Uh, what would happen is over time, those values would subtly shift to tailor themselves to the experiences that you preferred, right? And so either that would be through self-reporting, like you said, oh, I, I enjoyed having this 
maybe a longer driver duration or something like that, or more frequent breaks. Um, but it could also just be things like maybe uh, in the kind of mob programming RPG sense, like maybe the role that you are assigned um, or take on when you're not the driver. Um, furthermore, uh, we also included some information uh, that would try and like lead you into that particular role if it was something that maybe you personally had never had the opportunity to perform before. Um, and so it would kind of make these subtle suggestions that you could obviously override if you didn't want uh, to say, take on that role or have that break duration. But so it would kind of aggregate these uh, suggestions from everyone who is in the session. Uh, and so each person was sort of contributing their own kind of previous experience, and that would be aggregated for a particular session. Um, so that's probably the like subtle way. Um, the very direct way is that it would simply just tell you uh, like, oh, hey, I noticed you were spending more time, say, doing this as opposed to doing that um, through the form of like a toast or, or a, a message on your profile. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So toast messages or messages mm -hmm. of some kind if well, while you're running the tool. Okay, exactly, very cool. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I, I imagine Chris getting a hold of this and uh, using it for evil director purposes to oh, message definitely. all of his mobs. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 that's good. That's good. Yeah, I mean, uh, right on. Um and I guess uh, one more question, and then I'll let Chris ask some questions because I've uh, is is there a name of the tool, and is it available to download somewhere? So I think, and Yuki, correct me if I'm mistaken, but we're just kind of calling it Mob Programming Tutor. Um, we never had like a set name, uh, really, just because it was again kind of secondary to the research like it was more of a proof of concept that this type of tool could exist and would be beneficial on top of the existing systems for that educational purpose um it's currently not available for download uh, although the source is available um just because there's setup required to actually run it uh but it's not it's not as straightforward to run as some of the other tools because it really is like a platform. Um, granted, yes, if I could go back and containerize it and do all that kind of stuff, I would. Um, but at the time uh, we were, you know, really time pressed. Uh, and so we weren't able to do that, um, but it is available. Yeah. All right. Um, did you, uh, did you have any particular findings? Did you, did you run the tool with uh, kind of student, uh, students using it or, or anything along those lines, or um, I guess, how did the overall experiment play out once you had a tool working? Yeah, so we did. Um, we had a uh, kind of formative um, study that we did um, kind of right at the end uh, where we had uh, groups of students come in um, with no mob programming experience, uh, use the tool for a few sessions. Um, and those went pretty well. Um, again, partially being formative in a way, it was both for us to evaluate the tool and then also to see um, if the proof of concept held. Uh, and it, it worked well. Um, the students definitely understood sort of what was happening and they were able to kind of grasp some of the different roles. Um, unfortunately, to take like full advantage of it, uh, and with it being so data driven, you need to use it for quite a period um, for it to really personalize things. Uh, and so we did kind of artificially turn that up a little bit, um, just so in the, the couple of interactions that there were students would be able to experience that in a way, like it would start introducing more roles. Um, but we developed the tool with extensibility in mind so that say, oh, we wanted to go in and add support for more roles um, or to personalize surveys at the end in a different way or things like that. And because it being, uh, because the tool was so focused on research and we wanted to kind of lay a foundation for any future graduate students to continue working on it. Um, that, that, was, that was a big focus was to ensure that it could be expanded upon later. 
Yes. Right on, right on. Um, yeah, so kind of tying back into your uh, thesis work. Uh, so that that's uh, pretty great that you're, you know, sharing about this and talking about this uh, kind of on the ground floor as is, you know, soon after it's de developed for your thesis. Is your thesis, if anybody's more interested in the academic side, every once in a while we get questions from the mob programming community about, hey, what papers and things are done out there on mob programming? Is uh, your thesis available in some form? Or is it like the abstract you get and then you have to like log into some journal or something? <laughs> so they both are publicly available um, okay. through California State University, San Marcos. Um, so we can we can provide links to those. Um, okay. The uh, biggest thing though, and, and you bring up a really good point, is that there weren't very many formal papers or books or things like that that covered mob programming. Um, and actually that's where this show and you both made a significant contribution to our work and sort of directing us towards that type of information like Yuki and I would sit down and watch all of the episodes of the mob mentality um, to find other people uh, as we were performing our literature review um, and so honestly looking at our references may be a good place to find some of those um, it was a lot of talks uh, or articles, things like that. But yeah, not very many, uh, unfortunately, academic sources um, really doing a deep study on it. With the uh, with the tool now, is it kind of in a position for other students to take on as a project in the future? And uh, if so, what do you what do you hope to see them do? Um, we did have a few lined up, uh, and while we were developing the tool, we kind of looked at some others that existed, um, and one functionality that we talked about was, as opposed to, um, like, speech-to-text recognition, just speaker detection, um, so not necessarily being able to identify what you are saying as a way to, like, gauge if you're on topic or something like that. But just to identify maybe if one person is speaking more or one person's not speaking as much. Um, that was something that uh, another graduate student had been working on both while we were still there and um, it should be finishing up right about now. Um, but uh, no, absolutely. There were many students um, who were interested, uh, some that actually did commit to doing their thesis or doing research in that area uh, and extending the tool. Um, and that's why when we were building it, uh, a, such a big focus was ensuring that they could continue to do so. Um, because unfortunately, uh, in academia, you can end up in a situation where you kind of get handed someone else's work to continue. And that's a very awkward process. Um, and we've sort of been there ourselves, Yuki and I. Uh, and so trying to ensure that either it was well documented or flexible in the sense that, you know, oh, if I want to do this, I could, um, was was a, a very guiding principle for us. Nice. Right on, right on. Um, well, it's I think it's always fun to maybe do a little mini retro here um, mm -hmm. about your whole thesis and code development project uh, for each of you. So maybe... Uh, We'll pass the mic to each of you and you can share uh, if you can think of it, one thing that went well and one thing that went not so well and uh, <laughs> or a challenge or something they had to overcome uh, in doing this project. So uh, if you don't mind, Yuki, do you mind starting us off with that? I'd be curious. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah take a, I think it's mostly the doing good in the our process to view mm -hmm. our product and the, doing the city. Then one, I think the best thing is like a, actually make it you know make a student to use our product then our uh more programming helpers you know the tutors then people say okay so this is it's a little bit uh, hard to use in the you know our system but it, it works well then okay so this is really helpful for like studying uh collaboration they say but uh not sure but you know this is a good point for the getting feedback from the um the actual student then maybe you can um you know improve our system 
uh, based on the you know our feedback, right? So this is a good point. Then then I think it's one cons. It's like uh, I think it's we can build a um brand new um like a function. For instance, AI, you know, its models. We can do that, right? So we don't have a time to um actually um complete our our um architecture and our uh function. So eventually we can do the um more brand new function in the more programming community. This is our goal. So yeah. Yeah, how about for you, Christopher. Yeah, so we were we were building this like right at the cusp of say like chat GPT and that sort of stuff. And so for that educational research component, um, being able to leverage those tools may have been useful at the time, even just to say, generate a message to send to someone so it wasn't so hard coded. Um, but uh, with our thesis kind of having a deadline, um, you know, or else we have to stay more semesters, uh, we, we could have poured so much into this project. It could have easily become a dissertation um, for a PhD. And so uh, as a result, there were a lot of things that we had to cut uh, and, and that always hurt um, and, and ways that we could have made it better. And so retrospectively, you know, there are many things there that I wish we could have done um, or had time to do. Uh, but, you know, alongside trying to figure out all these different tools, um, do the research, the literature review, et cetera, design the application and then actually implement it, um, just took up uh, a large amount of time uh, and effort. Um, but I, I feel like what we were able to come up with um, was effective and it showed that as opposed to having these ephemeral tools, um, say like Pomodoro timers, et cetera, you can really get a beneficial um, experience by having them be more tailored to say your your previous sessions and things like that. And we even looked at things like, oh, maybe people you work better with. Um, and so kind of pro and con, we were able to lay the groundwork for this stuff, but we weren't able to, to go through it ourselves within the duration. Uh, of that thesis process, unfortunately. Nice, nice, right on. Cool, cool, cool. Chris, you got any more questions on this topic before we switch? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I, it, it's an interesting uh, thing, and you know, I certainly remember uh, trying to find uh, sources of literature and things like that, and and also. Uh, I, I I was also part my thesis was also continued mm -hmm. off of someone else's project. And so uh, I ended up flying uh, to where they lived to go talk to them in person yeah. and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so it was certainly uh, an experience. So it sounds, it sounds very interesting. But yeah, we're going to move on to the next topic. Cool, cool, cool. Well, yeah, so that this tool is super exciting. And uh, we'll definitely put a bunch of links to the things they talked about in the show notes. So check that out. Uh, but also, um, uh, another topic uh, on the docket for today was uh, mob programming in education. Uh, so uh, since that is uh, your your current context or previous context, and uh, yeah, so what are your thoughts here? Yeah, and so going back to that original point of um, trying to teach students how to collaborate uh, ends up being really difficult. Um, usually... Uh, what ends up happening is they get projects and they get put in groups. Uh, they don't know how to collaborate, so they don't have a good experience, and then they don't want to keep working together after that. Um, and that just repeats, repeats until they hate group work uh, and collaborating, or they they never learn how to collaborate in a group, um, form those like team collaboration and communication skills. Um, when it is so important in software development, um, so kind of looking at it through the lens of computer science. So coming into this, uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to address kind of in that intelligent tutoring system space um, was trying to find a topic that uh, was impactful, that was original, uh, that we were we would be able to build a tool for. Um, and so that seemed like kind of a fun, uh, interesting challenge um, that, like I said, hadn't really been explored before. 
Um, because, and, and you've had some people on the show already that have talked about, you know, using mob programming in the classroom um, or uh, in small groups uh, during lab time or something like that, or pair programming. And so again, we, we have that kind of foundation, that basis that, you know, instructor is already doing that or um, lab time students may be working together in groups. Uh, but trying to facilitate that process a little more closely um, so that one, they're learning terminology, they're kind of getting a feel for the methodology itself, as opposed to, you know, a traditional lecture style, right? I'm standing at the board saying, this is what a driver is and a navigator, um, and kind of letting them learn by doing it, um, because that's a, a very effective way for, for this type of thing. Um, a, a methodology or process like this. Um, and so that was kind of ultimately what, what we were trying to do. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, I guess I can see that. It's a difficult, <laughs> I've definitely been in the, uh, uh, maybe the collaboration crazy cycle in, mm -hmm. uh, in college before, um, where I think my first experience was I just, we, we had no checkpoint until like the day before the final due date. Mm -hmm. And basically n other people didn't do stuff. And then me and another person were up all night, literally with like one hour sleep yeah, and put it all together. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah. And it's like, oh, that didn't go very well. <laughs> but as a student, I didn't go like, oh, that didn't go very well. Let's have a retro and figure out how to do this better next time, you know? And it's just like, then you go into the next class and you have collaboration and then you're just kind of winging it again. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've definitely felt the problem uh, before. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I guess you see this tool as a way, so they would use it. So I guess it would be used in a class that is mm -hmm. having mobbing, but it would help them learn how to mob better so they don't, abandon it because it didn't work or something like that i guess yeah 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 okay, exactly cool. so it would kind of be a gentle introduction to okay. the philosophy or mindset okay. but then it could also then start to tailor the experience over time okay um, so that say oh they they went and worked with another group it, it wouldn't be a fresh star and it would be able to introduce like say oh hey we're going to add in this new role um, here's a description of kind of what that should be like the cheerleader, right? Or the nose or something like that from the mob programming RPG. Right. Um, and would be able to explain like, oh, this, this sort of piece of the software controls this, you know, maybe don't touch that yet. Or, or it would be locked until they were able to, you know, go through a few sessions and understand like, okay, now I've seen like the break frequency um, is set at this, and maybe I don't like that. Let me make that a little longer or something. Um, but yeah, just trying to address that idea of, you know, oh, like, you know, the one person or a few people doing all the work or not knowing how to communicate. Because, you know, we do touch on, say, agile and things like that uh, when we eventually get to software engineering stuff. Usually that's around like the late sophomore, early junior level. Um, but this is something that you could just start, you know, in one of the first programming classes that they have. Uh, it doesn't really link to anything else. Um, where sure, you could talk about like a retrospective uh, in that context. Um, and so ultimately that was kind of the, the hope is that not only could this be something that students like maybe use in a lab in one class, but that they could realistically use throughout their entire educational career and kind of gradually get that experience tailored to them. Um, we did also set it up so it could work with just pair programming, um, but ultimately uh, the the focus was on, on mob programming. Hmm. Yeah. What's an example of... Uh how the tool might communicate with someone to help improve like specifically collaboration. Is there, is there anything specific that you have there? Um, so one of the things, uh, and I believe I mentioned this earlier was something like, Oh, maybe you're, you know, uh, talking more than the other person or something like that. Mm -hmm. And some of those aspects do get 
kind of difficult to gauge, especially automatically. Um, and so we we relied in our tool, especially in its initial state, how it is now, more on self-reporting. So did you enjoy that experience? Mm -hmm. um, was there an aspect that you did or did not like? Um, and so basically after each session, you would end up taking a, a personalized survey um, of like, oh, did you say, think the breaks were too short or too long? Um, have too many of them? Did you like this role or not? Mm. Um, and then uh, we, we uh, while doing our research, uh, collaborated briefly with um, some researchers at Carnegie Mellon, again, some people who you had on the show. Um, and they had a similar tool, um, a few tools actually, uh, where, you know, they were like, having cameras, like watching people and microphones were like kind of monitoring speech and all that kind of stuff, right? So you can go really deep into that automatic detection um, or using a particular environment that say like logging keystrokes and things like that. Um, but we wanted to go a kind of less hands-on or locked in approach so that you could use any editor, you could use um, kind of any environment in any space, whether it's in person or kind of asynchronous, uh, like we would do um, in, in our kind of uh, step into mob programming with, with you both. Um, and so while doing that, we kind of realized that modifying the timer, right, the timer was the thing that was consistent kind of across all of those different uh, experiences. Um, and so being able to kind of make the timer smarter uh, and also kind of try to give it the functionality where we could uh, to give you feedback would, would be, in our opinion, kind of the best, the best approach. Were there any patterns with the adjustments made to, to the timer? Like were, were people tending to go with longer timers, shorter timers? Did, did the tool automatically adjust this in that direction? How did that work? So if I understand, um, you're asking, were there any patterns that we saw based on kind of the studies that we did? Yeah. Um, there were maybe a few just with the, the breaks and things like that, or, or especially roles, like people would say, oh, I just don't like this role, or I prefer to do this instead. Um, but uh, a lot of those intro studies um, were very uh, hands off from Yuki and I. So we just kind of put people in a room with a computer <laughs> and said, here's a problem um, from uh, some katas. Uh, we said, here, go ahead and, and try and do these, use this tool, follow this methodology. And so a lot of it was just them kind of messing with it. Uh, and so unfortunately, we didn't get a ton of long-term um, data from that. Uh, but there were some trends like things uh, like we found that people preferred to actually have slightly longer driver durations than we originally thought. Um, so probably in like the four, like four minute range, mm -hmm. um, some more frequent but shorter breaks was also something that we saw. But again, that was in a kind of classroom environment as opposed to like in, in an office. Um, and so that that was something else that we considered that uh, this could also just be deployed, you know, at an office um, or, or in that in that space as opposed to in a classroom. Cool, cool, cool. Nice, nice. Right on. Yeah. And uh, so thanks for sharing all that, Christopher. Um, Yuki, have you had any um, experiences uh, with mobbing in education or, or your, your thoughts kind of on this topic? Um, it's like for me, for my uh, on my side, it's like, uh, so for instance, in ChatGPT is coming up, you know, I, I was thinking to using more like, uh, um, generative AI, uh, with the collaboration stuff. So when I, we, when we and, you know, it's Chris and me was trying to build our product. So ChatGPT is, it's not common. Then it's not sophisticated. So we don't have any like a choice to use uh, ChatGPT, but Right now we have, it's a good AI, you know, model is available uh, through the open source, right? So we can actually think, so it, this is just my opinion, but we, we can think about 
we can use the um AI with our collaboration team, like for instance, we can mix the students and AI uh with this in the same team. We can collaborate to each other with the AI. That's that's kind of an interesting topic for me. So um eventually we can um maybe we can do the um collaboration with the AI. It, it's gonna be the it's big big topic is collaboration with AI and the human. So yeah, it, it's gonna be more productive, I think. Yeah. Nice. Right on. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, and I guess um if I were to draw an analogy with learning how to collaborate, learning how to mob, you know, and helping students learn that, I think it, you know, something that comes to mind for me is like, you know, my kids uh are really into certain things like musical theater and baseball and football. And so like having like a coach teach, you know, either a whole team, like, like a classroom or mm -hmm. like a whole, or like a one-on-one -on -one with a student is, has a ton of benefit and a ton of pros and cons. And even though maybe that is the most effective way to help them learn baseball, for example, that doesn't mean that there's not other tools like in the system that, you know, family or friends might buy or that they may want that when the teacher's not around to help kind of influence them in the right direction. Right. And so, while maybe ideally me throwing them a pitch and giving them feedback is the best for them to learn baseball or like, you know, mobbing with an expert in mobbing or someone who's experienced. It doesn't mean that when I'm not around, they don't have like a, a pitch back net so they can throw it and it'll come back at them and then they can, you know, kind of simulate that. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, it's pretty interesting, like seeing all these tools spring up because it's almost creating like an uh, ecosystem of uh, like you would see with baseball or things, you know, tools to help people, learn and instead of them being like opposing like one replaces the other it's almost kind of like a uh, chain mail where they like all you know it's kind of can, can help support each other uh so to speak um so I, I don't know that that's kind of where my mind goes as far as like where it plays out in the mob programming community um did you have any other thoughts on how you kind of see it uh integrating with the rest of the, the rest of the stuff that's out there for collaboration and mobbing <laughs> um so th this tool kind of took a very different approach um, in the sense that uh, it wasn't, it couldn't be simple, right? Like a, a, a making a Pomodoro timer could be like a, a good project-based learning thing, right? Of like, oh, let me make a Pomodoro timer really quick um, or to like learn front-end development. But uh, we needed to have a lot of data and, and a whole back-end in order to kind of support the idea that, oh, when you start the application and there's a, a default number there, like it's not just, you know, five all the time, you know, it's it's coming from uh, data, it's coming from stuff personalized to you. And that's, that's one of the really big aspects of intelligent tutoring systems and kind of what separates them from just like smart tools. Um, is that they, they kind of represent or have a model uh, of each student or each user. Um, and so that was one of the, the things that we found that even like say with some of the CMU systems where they were kind of using mob programming um, in maybe an intelligent tutoring system, the mob programming part wasn't a component in that or um, the same thing like just with uh, many mob programming timers uh, being ephemeral in nature where, you know, oh, I started up you know, it's great. It's fast. It does what it should do. Um, we need to have have something that was different, right? Unfortunately, mm. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we had to kind of reinvent the wheel in a way, um, or scaffold all this other stuff to make that kind of simple timer uh, be better or smarter in a way. Um, and so I, I think it definitely has its place. Uh, especially in that education sphere. Um, but it's it's not really meant to be a long-term replacement for, say, like the timer. Like if if you knew what you were doing, um, you could just load up, you know, Mavador or whatever and, and be fine. Um, especially if kind of everyone on the team was sort of on the same page. Uh, this would maybe be ideal if you were really interested in learning and you had a group of people who were interested in learning. Um, or you were in a classroom where you were being told to to do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
on the surface, I would say it's it's probably similar. Um, so it's not it's not super different. Uh, probably the only thing that's obviously different is that you know you make an account and you kind of log in and things like that. Um, where we have that divide between like, oh, I, I have a desktop application and then I like log in on this portal and I can like look at statistics and things like that. So maybe if people were interested in kind of looking at that data, um, that, that could be one aspect. Um, or if they were just interested in kind of a more uh, kind of homogeneous uh, and, and complete uh, introduction to mob programming where you know, we're taking stuff from the mob programming RPG and remote mob programming and all these different sources, courtesy of you, thank you very much, uh, to try and synthesize like what a tutorial would be as if you were going through it like session by session. Mm. I would say that's probably like the one unique aspect that, and again, we could have taken this much further and I wish we could have, and I hope to do in the future. Um, but that, that was probably the one kind of really different thing. Yeah. yeah and I, I think that that is super cool. And it, it reminds me that, um, you know, one thing Chris and I talk a lot about is continuous improvement and continuous mm -hmm. retrospectives, continue improving, no matter how experienced you are, no matter how much you think you know. And the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? And even when you think you're an expert in something, someone else will surprise you with something they're teaching you or you know, uh, mm -hmm. large language models will teach you or data will surprise you and then you learn something. And so it almost feels like to me, like, you know, uh, it'd be fun to turn it on with so-called experts or practitioner, you know, experienced practitioners. It almost reminds me of like how the pros in baseball, they'll have, you know, an experienced tutor or coach and, but they'll also, you know, the new analytics where there's videos watching them swing and you're getting like mm -hmm. live feedback and all these stats about their swing and what they do. And it almost feels like something like that, that it could be like a supplement and data collector and, you know, almost like a replay of, of data and, and insight that um, is almost maybe more than what a human could do or different than what the, the in-person tutor could do. But um, yeah, now, now I'm, now I'm futurizing and, putting on the uh, yeah I, I like I said I, I there were so many things that I wish we could have done yeah yeah um, no that's cool that like honestly if I end up doing a PhD at some point I'm gonna dive in on this but <laughs> right now <laughs> yeah right yeah. now I, I gotta focus on just getting my <laughs> kind of foot in the door teaching yeah for sure for sure <clears throat> cool cool all right well uh we might be coming up to time here and so uh it has been a great discussion. Um, is there anything that uh, both of you would like to plug or share uh, kind of as we end the show? And maybe Christopher, you can start and then Yuki can go after. Yeah, so absolutely got to watch every every episode of the Mob Mentality, right? Because that was how we were able to get a really good understanding of mob programming and that whole ecosystem uh, to the point where we were able to write a thesis on it. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, there are so many resources like buried in all of the different people who've been on. And so really just go through, if you're interested, go through and read those. If you maybe want to look through a really long document, um, you can look at our thesis uh, and go through that reference page. That may be helpful. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in education uh, and collaboration and developing ed tech, feel free to reach out. Awesome. And uh, Yuki, how about you? Anything to plug or share? Yep. So I, I have a, this more, more programming community right now. So, but it is more and more people then um, getting involved in the community, then expand the community, the ecosystem. So I hope the more people enjoy the more programming. Thank you. All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, both of you, for being on. And then to our audience, uh, if you are, if you know somebody who uh, is in academia somehow and uh, might be interested in in expanding people uh, people's collaborative techniques, uh, then certainly point them to this episode. Uh, you know, comment about what you've uh, heard here. 
uh, like, subscribe, and share. And thanks for listening. And until next time, we'll see you all later. Bye, everybody.